Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians conference. This panel is titled All Aboard the Orient Expression, Reclaiming Asian Perspectives and Identity in the Age of Imperialism. These papers examine the ways in which Asian peoples experience colonization and war and develop their own cultural identity under a European lens from an Asian perspective. Before we begin the session, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded and treaty territories of many indigenous peoples who have stewarded the land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep rooted and long lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in our video description below. We have three speakers here today and going in no particular order, um, except of course the order in which they will be presented. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Shafika Jafar with her paper titled Merchants Now Rule Our Land, Early British Rule in Singapore, 1819 to 1840, through the eyes of the native trading classes. Shafika Jafar is presently an assistant curator with the National Museum of Singapore. Her work focuses on the intersections of history, literature, and visual culture, primarily of the Malay archipelago between the 19th and early 20th centuries. Recently, this manifested in the exhibit A Voyage of Love and Longing at the National Museum of Singapore. She also handles literary translation from classical Malay into English. She is presently working on an upcoming joint translation of Abdullah bin Abdul Qadir Munsi's Shia Singapura Terbakar. Shafiga, please come on and present the beginning of your paper. Thanks, Jeremy, for the very kind introduction. So today I'd like to begin by sharing about one of the poems I looked at in it. So composed in Malay, the poem is titled Inisha Erdagang Virtual Beli Dikarang Ole Tuan Simi di Negeri Singapura. Or my English translation, the poem of traders buying and selling, composed by Tuan Simi, the land of Singapore. So the poem itself isn't explicitly dated, but from the context within the verses, it seems to have been written somewhere between 1820 to 1823. This coincided with the immediate years after the British East India Company managed to set up a trading post on the island of Singapore in 1819, but before the full session of the island to the EIC in 1824. So Tuan Simi, as the author chose to identify himself, was then working for the company as a native writer, perhaps posted to the customs house near the port, where he claimed to have composed the poem. Traditionally, a poem of the Sha'in genre, like this one by Tuan Simi, would be sung aloud to a listening audience. But to spare everyone the horror, I'll just read parts of the verses out normally. Just a disclaimer, since there hasn't been a full translation of the poem until now, the translations you'll be hearing are mine. Tuan Simi began his poem with a description of where he was and who he intended his listeners to be. Sha'ir di karang di dalam pabean, didengar dilihat semata sekalian. This poem composed in the customs house to be heard and seen by one and all. He then proceeded to describe the new order of things in Singapore, now de jure under company rule. He painted it as an inversion or perhaps even corruption of what was considered the patut or proper state of things in traditional Malay polities, where it was frowned upon for rulers to take part in trade. Hence, Tuan Simi wrote, Sekarang saudagar memerintahkan negeri, tandanya dunia sudahlah akhiri. Now merchants rule our land, a sure sign the world is at its end. Terbaliklah sudah hujan ke langit, dan perintah sekalian tersebut. The rain now falls upwards to the sky with law and order both caught in a bind. Tuan Simi then spent the bulk of his poem detailing an incident of a trade dispute between a Malena holder, or captain of a ship, also a trader in this case, and a Chinese trader. What happened was that the two guys got into a fight because Instead of paying in cash as promised, the Chinese trader told the Nahoda to accept payment in bills of rejected cotton cloth. So eventually, the both of them ended up in the police court. There, the Nahoda sought to press charges against the trader for fraud. The trader was found guilty, but the court told the Nahoda that if he wanted the trader to be detained, he would have to pay for the detainment until the trader was able to pay him back in full for his goods. Now that's just ridiculous. And the Nahoda thought so too, 
Plus, he couldn't afford to pay for the detainment or wait for it to end. So he chose to withdraw his charges, accept his losses, and let the trader go. Throughout all this, Tuan Simi made his sympathies clear. It was the Pinahoda and other Malay traders who might have found themselves in similar situations. In fact, he prefaced his narration of the incident with this verse. Kerananya ada di dalam sekarang, banyak yang terkena bukannya seorang, yang betul benar sekarang dan jarang, berjanji ringgit dibayarnya sekarang. The law that has come in place today has consumed too many as its prey. How rare it is now to see fair play when cash is given without delay. The verdict passed by the court was described by Tuan Simi as perintah yang bala, a cursed ruling. He ended the poem with a word of caution for traders coming from the Malay archipelago, giving them advance notice of what to expect, aware that many might not be familiar with the new way of doing things in Singapore. He warned them not to be overly trusting of the British and the justice system. He wrote, Akan halnya kita Bugis dan Melayu harapkan orang putih juga selalu hukum bicaranya kelihatan terlalu mulut disuap pantat disumbu. The thing about us, Bugis and Malays, we like to rely on the whites, always. Exceedingly good with their wordplay, while filling our mouths, they impale our ass. He also drew the attention to the arrangements between the British and Chinese and Indian traders. He wrote, because the goods being put up for trade, they mostly belong to the white men. The Indians and Chinese traders own nothing, it is said. They are simply acting as middlemen. Into white men's hands, they always go. The way things are, of this you must know. So actually, in my research, I came to find out that this poem was acquired as translation practice for one of the company officials based in Singapore, Second Lieutenant T.J. Newbold, who served as quartermaster in the 1830s. The sole manuscript containing this poem then somehow made its way into the French National Library and only resurfaced to public knowledge in 1993 when Muhammad Haji Saleh published a transliteration. Curiously enough, since then, no one within the larger circuit of colonial Singapore historiography seemed to have picked up on this poem. The exception was one literary scholar, Azza Ibrahim, who wrote about it in a small section in his 2017 book, Narrating Presence. Now, why is that the case? Granted, such a poem as this one is considered a minor source, but it still sheds valuable light on how the early years of Singapore under company rule was not the gloss tale of trade success is often made out to be. So why do these voices hardly feature in our historical narratives? I propose several reasons based on my observations about the state of history writing in and on Singapore. Firstly, the slow shift in narratological framing of British colonialism in Singapore as a positively transformative experience. I note that there have been numerous attempts to complexify this narrative since the 1970s, but the trope of from fishing village to bustling port city, thank you Stanford Raffles, continue to be the go-to description, refusing to go away like some stubborn kitchen stain. Secondly, I find that there is still an over-reliance of sorts on anglophonic materials and types of sources that conform to conventional ideas of what constitute historical sources, basically archival materials, but particularly those that fit empirical data. So things like foreign office papers, letters, documents, census, and so forth. Whereas things like literature, for instance, particularly those in vernacular languages, are still held at an uncomfortable arm's length. The last reason has less to do with sources and more to do with the discipline of history itself. Attempts to put forth alternative forces, alternative angles, alternative approaches do run up against gatekeeping walls that sort of indirectly determine who gets to write histories, whose voices get to be heard and how. So taken together, these reasons contribute to somewhat of a stasis in the realm of history writing in and on Singapore with implications on our historical imagination and memory of the colonial era. The first implication is that histories that don't conform to existing narratives are cast to the peripheries, good to have as additions, but never quite able to speak on an equal level of dominant narratives. The second implication is that this puts vernacular sources particularly to extra tasks, especially those that take on forms unlike conventional historical sources. This creates a layer of disqualification even before attempts to write history based on these materials have begun. Moving forward, where and how do we go from here? 
I guess the question we're pondering over is to what extent are absent histories truly absent? Is it just a consequence of unavailable sources, the inability of historians to manage materials in the vernacular, or at the risk of upsetting my fellow historians, is it something more structural and systematic within our discipline itself? I'd like to leave us all with something from the thesis on theory and history by the Wallen Collective, headed by Ethan Kleinberg, Joan Scott, and Gary Builder. If we think of the historian as akin to the interpreter of dreams, we see that those who look to make literal sense of the dream by presenting it in a chronological, realist, and self-evident manner are recognized and rewarded. But those whose inquiries lead to the obscure navel of the dream, the place where narratives and interpretations stop making conventional sense, are ignored or dismissed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shafika. This leads us to our second speaker, Simon Lam, with his paper titled Contemporary Anxieties, Selective Memories, The Missing Narrative of the Indian Prisoner of War in Hong Kong. Simon is an assistant project officer at the Hong Kong and South China Historical Research Program at Lingnan University. He is currently writing a book on the medical history of Hong Kong. His research focuses on the experience of war in modern China with a particular interest in the diplomatic relations of warlords in the South China region. He will be beginning DPhil studies at the University of Oxford this autumn and is an Ask Historians moderator. Welcome Simon, and you may begin. When the British colony of Hong Kong fell to Japan on the 25th of December, 1941, some 3,500 Indian soldiers from the Hong Kong and Singapore Royal Artillery, the 2nd Battalion of the 14th Punjabi Regiment, the 5th Battalion of the 7th Rajput Regiment, and other units became prisoners of war, or POWs in short. Soon after, activists of the Indian Independence League, assisted by the Japanese, formed the Indian National Army, also known in short as the INA, in June 1942 to secure Indian independence from British rule through military means. In Hong Kong, at least 500 POWs were recruited to serve in the INA, while some left to serve with the main INA body in Burma. Up to 400 Indians became POW camp guards clerks, policemen, and drivers under Japanese employ in Hong Kong. The emergence of the Indian National Army caused considerable anxiety among British officials. Redoubled efforts were made to monitor the situation in Hong Kong, with a fierce propaganda war being waged between the British and the Japanese over the loyalties of Indian POWs. A scheme was devised by British intelligence to send in letters written by prominent Indians to encourage POWs to conduct escape attempts while a pamphlet smuggled into the camps reported great victories in North Africa, Stalingrad, and New Guinea, and reassured the reader that India was peaceful and had a good harvest year. These assurances were false. The quit Indian movement organized by the Indian National Congress led to major civic and political disruption in India in August 1942, while food shortages from 1941 onwards would later result in the Bengal famine of 1943. There were similar propaganda efforts made by the Japanese. Indian soldiers and officers were separated from each other to remove the influence of pro-British officers over their men. And soldiers were also subject to compulsory weekly lectures which disparaged the allied cause. An African-American named Clark, who was accidentally interned with the Indian troops, reports that when the Red Cross supplies arrived in the colony, the Indians were told that nothing had been provided for them and that all parcels were addressed to British officers, when in fact a portion was indeed allocated to Indians. Surprisingly to many, unlike Indian POWs in Malaya, there were no whole-scale defections in Hong Kong. Many Punjabi Muslim detainees refused to serve or even associate themselves with the Indian National Army, with only 100 out of 1,400 interned Punjabi Muslims eventually joining the INA. There was active resistance among the POWs, and many protested strongly against the removal of pro-British officers from the camp and refused to participate in military drill. By mid-1942, all Indian POWs were interned at Ma Tho Chung Camp, where they successfully communicated with British officers at the neighboring Argyle Street Camp by hiding messages in a communal vegetable garden. Some of them even managed to escape from the camp. Out of 139 POWs rescued by the British Army Aid Group, a British intelligence group based in South China, 111 were Indians. By September 1943, POW numbers in Mato Chung Cap had dwindled to 424 men, as many had been forced to work as laborers in mainland China. The remaining men had steadfastly refused to either take up arms or work for the Japanese. This begs the question, 
why were most Indian POWs in Hong Kong indifferent to Indian National Army entreaties? The Combined Services Detailed Interrogation Center India, a British organization set up to interrogate detainees, claimed that it was the soldiers' attachment to their officers that enabled the Punjabi Muslims to resist INA recruitment. However, as Gajendra Singh notes, some Indian officers did play a prominent role in encouraging soldiers to defect, such as commissioned officer Hakim Khan of the Punjabi Regiment. Singh instead points to the communal nature of resistance, the restrained relations between Sikh and Muslim POWs, and the interrogation reports note the strong disapproval of Muslim soldiers, of both the framed pictures of Gandhi and the chanting of pro-Indian National Congress slogans by Hindu and Sikh POWs. Singh argues the refusal of Punjabi Muslims to join the INA can be explained through their perception of the INA as a predominantly Sikh and Hindu organization. Although Singh's analysis provides valuable insights into the communal divide, it fails to show why loyalty to the Raj, or at the very least, indifference towards the Indian National Army existed even among Sikh and Hindu prisoners. The rejection of the INA by Sikh soldiers is especially surprising, considering that in late 1940, the Sikh military contingent in Hong Kong had organized a sit-in, refusing to wear new steel helmets, which conflicted with their religious vows to keep their hair unshorn. Clearly, there was no love lost between the Sikhs and British in Hong Kong, and many were indeed afraid that Sikh POWs would develop a strong anti-British sentiment. From contemporary reportage, I would like to suggest two additional reasons for Sikh and Hindu indifference. The first being a general awareness of the changing tide of war. And secondly, the poor treatment of Indian POWs at the hands of the Japanese. Initially, Indian armed guards treated non-Indian POWs badly, with some taking perverse pleasure in beating their former British officers. Reports by expatriated non-Indian POWs note a marked change in attitude among Indian guards after Allied success, with a particular turning point being December 1942. One report states, and I quote, Whereas before they had been bulldozing and insolent, they suddenly became quite friendly with internees, end quote. Japanese recruitment efforts also changed in nature during late 1942 with the failure of more conciliatory measures. When Indian internees adamantly refused to assist anti-guerrilla patrols in Hong Kong's new territories, they were threatened at gunpoint to participate in the sweeps. Those who agreed to cooperate with the Japanese were freed from the camps. But when they went into the streets of Hong Kong, they found out that the food outside of the camps were too expensive for their meager salaries. A chic driver complained that he could not obtain either lard or flour essential for cooking traditional dishes, while permission to keep goats, the favored meat of the chic community, was denied by Japanese authorities. Just the Japanese, for all their pan asianist rhetoric, merely considered the Indian POWs as a useful propaganda and political tool, revealing themselves to be no different from the colonial powers they critiqued. The Indian POW in Hong Kong was truly caught between two empires. I decided to conduct research on the Indian POW in Hong Kong because I was disappointed to find that with the exception of Gajendra Singh's study, there is almost no mention of their experiences in the existing literature. This is especially egregious considering the vast amount of publications on European, Canadian, and Eurasian POWs in Hong Kong, which often results in a rather Eurocentric perspective. Why have Indian POWs been neglected so much in historiography? The main difficulty is the scarcity of Indian voices in available sources. Kaushik Roy points out that oral interviews and autobiographies of Indian privates are almost non-existent, with many unwilling or unable to recall their experiences. In British files, wartime reports on Indian POWs mostly come from non-Indian escapees who invariably hold pro-British attitudes. Significantly, there was a whole scale destruction of Japanese records in Hong Kong before the surrender of the garrison, leaving Japanese-sponsored newspapers the main existing source of information on Japanese attitudes. Historians are therefore forced to rely on limited evidence produced by colonizers to reveal the experiences of the colonized. A further limitating factor is the general lack of interest in the history of ethnic minorities in Hong Kong. While preparing for this paper, I was shocked to find that there were only two English language history books with a focus on the Indian community in Hong Kong, both written before 2000 and none in Chinese. There is little awareness of the foundational role played by Indians in the development of Hong Kong into a modern metropolis, 
especially in a historical narrative so dominated by Chinese and Western perspectives. I hope that my presentation today can be one tiny step forward in restoring the narrative of the city's Indian community to the wider framework of Hong Kong history and in further eliminating the choices faced by those caught between empires. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Finally, we have our third speaker, Shirin Sajidpur, with her paper titled Three Wise Men of Meiji, Forging a Japanese Aesthetic Tradition at the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. Shirin M. Sajidpur is a PhD student at the University of Chicago with a focus on late 19th and early 20th century Japanese and German history. Her research relies heavily on the use of material culture to explore the role of art and architecture in the cultivation of a national body politic and the formation of a modern state. More broadly, her research interrogates the pre-war parallels of the Kaiserreich and Imperial Japan by examining the negotiation and expression of clashing values, tradition and modernity in comparable efforts to assert cultural legitimacy on the international stage. Welcome, Shirin, and you may begin. After the collapse of the Tokugawa regime in 1868, Japan transformed its feudal and agrarian society into an industrialized global competitor that was politically and economically capable of meeting Western standards of modernity. Despite this, the Meiji government grappled with a very major crisis. It had successfully averted the imperial powers that endangered its Asian neighbors, but at the cost of abandoning traditional elements of its national identity. So Japan's entrance into the global arena really generated a discussion on the language of beauty and cultural conceptions of art, especially in the context of international expositions and Western beliefs that these cultural origins and progress were manifest in a nation's art provoked a reevaluation of Japan's own art history and therefore the efforts to really define the contours of a national aesthetic tradition were deeply entangled with Japanese assertions of autonomy. The emergence of what is understood today as Japanese art can really be attributed to the collaborative efforts between a baron, Kuki Ryuki, an asti, Okakura Kakuzo, and a professor, Ernest Fenelosa. And they formed a history of Japanese art that exalted Japan's indigenous ways while challenging Western stereotypes that rendered Japan as underdeveloped, backward, or degenerate. And in this sense, art was chosen as the appropriate medium to really leverage Japan's cultural legitimacy in a Western world. And Japan's resulting display at the exposition uh, of the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 was an artistic and architectural feat that not only embodied a universally recognizable linear advancement of the nation, but also presented Western fairgoers with a society that was an equal, if not superior, alternative to those of the West. So the centerpiece of the exhibition was the Hoden, which translates to the Phoenix Hall. The structure not only constituted the greatest single expenditure at the exposition, but also took up the largest square footage of any nation represented, including the Western powers. And central to the Imperial Commission was the Baron Kuki, and his continued involvement with Okakura and Fenelosa ultimately guided the direction of the Japanese Phoenix Hall. So a bit on the fair itself, the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 was held in commemoration of Christopher Columbus's alleged discovery of America. Uh, Chicago's organizing committee agreed to house a robe of national, national pavilions along the Midway Plaisance and participating nations were encouraged to purchase allotments on the site. But the arrangement of the nations was not arbitrary in any way. It acted as a kind of hierarchy of civilization, and the plaisance was a visual representation of a very eugenics-inspired understanding of cultural worth. So while Western European nations occupied the most coveted spaces, its colonies and non-Western nations were relegated to the peripheries of the fairground. And as a result, the strategic positioning of the world's cultures revealed this motive to introduce millions of American attendees to evolutionary conceptions of race. So members of the commission really recognized the cultural implications of the pavilion's location and attempted to subvert the fair's racial dynamics by engaging in negotiations to secure a place within the hierarchy. And unlike the displays of other participants, the Phoenix Hall was neither among the foreign buildings nor the midway, but instead actually obtained exclusive use of the wooded aisle. And according to the commission's official report, the space was absolutely necessary to show the true nature of the great empire of the Orient. And the seclusion of the Phoenix Hall was symbolic of both Japan's geographic detachment from Asia in continental Asia and its desired status as an autonomous state that was uninflicted by imperial forces. 
The Phoenix Hall was constructed in the style of the ancient Phoenix Temple in Uji, and it consisted of three buildings. Both the original and contemporary buildings centrally feature the mythical Phoenix, which is known for its regenerative abilities. And in the same way that the Phoenix represented the endurance of Japan's imperial lineage, it also symbolized the continued vitality of Japanese arts over the course of its very long history. So Okakura was tasked with the circulate or the curation of objects that were displayed in the hall, and he published a pamphlet that was specifically geared towards and distributed to white viewers and allowed him to carefully manage the very method of viewing the pavilion for the audience. And despite insisting on presenting the true Japan to its readers, uh, the pamphlet actually begins with a lie. He writes that Japan, the land of the rising sun, has been from ancient times considered the birthplace of the phoenix, despite the wealth of archaeological evidence that the phoenix's Asian variation actually originated in Shang Dynasty China. Japan had historically attempted to really trivialize the influence of and reliance on Chinese culture. And Okakura's claim that the phoenix can be traced back to indigenous Japan rather than Chinese mythology uh, exemplifies Japan's modification and erasure of very important elements of their history. So while Okakura acknowledges the presence of China in Japanese culture, he does so in a very disdainful manner. And it suggests that the legacy of Chinese influences is something that Japan is really attempting to expel from its own cultural fabric. And this very antagonistic perception of Chinese influences really reinforces the Meiji government's desire to not only symbolically sever Japan from continental Asia, uh, but also emancipate itself from a very long history of cultural borrowing. So the three wings of the hall recreate fine arts from the Fujiwara, Ashikaga, and the Tokagura eras. But the assignment of these eras was in no way arbitrary either. The periods really correspond with a very Western-centric historical narrative of pre-Columbian, Columbian, Columbian, and industrialization eras. So this really provided a frame of reference that a Western audience could favorably measure its own history against that of Japan. And the left wing of the hall was designed in accordance with trends of the Fujiwara era. And in the pamphlet, uh, Okakura characterizes the era as the renaissance of pure Japanese taste that reached a height of cultivation. And this really evokes the historic European renaissance of the 14th to 16th centuries. But Okakura makes it very clear that Japan's artistic renaissance had predated that of the West by several hundred years. And it occurred during continental Europe's crisis for the Middle Ages. Uh, In short, the wing really established the antiquity of Japan's aesthetic sophistication by displaying works that were created even centuries before the discovery of America. So the right wing of the hall reflected the Ashikaga era, and Okakura notes here that at the time Columbus discovered the new world, Japan was emerging from civil wars of the two preceding dynasty and began a new art life under the influence of Zen Buddhism. And the mounted paintings in the hall, the side of the hall, were modern recreations of works done by the great Japanese landscape artist Seshu, who was actually a contemporary of Christopher Columbus. Finally, the central section of the Phoenix Hall represented the style in vogue during the Tokagura dynasty of shoguns. And the art displayed reflected progress in many respects. Uh, And he says that it was owed to the peace and general prosperity enjoyed by the country for nearly 300 years. And the hall was divided into three chambers as well, um, all of which were exclusively adorned with paintings of flowers, birds, and fruit. And all of these symbolized, according to Okakura, uh, progress, vitality, and abundance, respectively. So it was during this period, the Tokagura period, that Japan was, as most Western nations believe, discovered by Commodore Perry. But the characterization of this period as one of peace and prosperity signified that Japan had attained the highest standards of civilization without the guidance of a Western nation, which challenged two very widespread assumptions at the time. The first is that civilization begins with the age of exploration. And second, that a non-Western society's transition from a barbaric to a civilized country could not occur autonomously, but instead only became possible once that society came into direct contact with the West. Not only did the Japanese maintain near isolation from the Western world until the 19th century, but it also actively rejected multiple European civilizing missions 
and expeditions during and after the 16th century. And Okakura demonstrated that the Japanese had successfully brought enlightenment to themselves um, as symbolized by the very definition of the era Meiji, which means enlightened rule. Uh, in this sense, the history of Japanese art as defined by Okakura was not really a record of Japanese antiquity, but rather a constructed product of a national ideology. Leaders like Okakura really wielded aesthetics to leverage Japan's cultural autonomy in the international stage. And prior to the Meiji era, actually, a comprehensive history of Japanese art didn't actually exist. Uh, but in the years following the Columbian Exposition, Kuki, Okakura, and Fenelosa attempted to do just that. Over the course of the next decade, the three men undertook a Meiji government-sponsored project to develop a criteria for Japanese art and establish a framework for writing a history of Japanese art. And the resulting work that they actually wrote together was titled A History of Japanese Art, and it was a chronology that formed the basis of what we understand still today as Japanese art. It skillfully corresponds with and reinforced the two pillars of Meiji modernity, the first being nationalism and the second being the emperor system, which together form something called kokushikan, which is a belief that Japanese history and tradition are consolidated under the unbroken succession of emperors, even though there are recorded gaps within the lineage. And the compilation of a government sanctioned art history really brought together Japan's foremost art collectors, artists, and scholars, and endowed the record with a historicity and authority that allowed this rewritten history to regain and gain recognition within the rest of Japanese society and ultimately the world. Thank you. Thank you, Shirin. With that, we now move into the discussion section of this panel. And I'd like to begin by asking a question that to begin with really is mostly focused on our first two panelists, though, of course, the discussion may move forward from it. And it concerns a sort of a similarity between both the Singapore and Hong Kong cases, which is that Indians in Hong Kong and Malays in Singapore either are or were or became minority populations within the wider makeup of these two societies. So what I would like to ask is how you would say this has affected I suppose more specifically, the ways that these minorities' histories have been written about, or indeed not written about, as the case may be. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, generally speaking, I won't say that um, the history of the Malay community in Singapore um, has been fully excluded. It's always there, but it's um, it's not written as central. So, okay, so I'll just take the example of the colonial period, for instance. Um, yeah, most, his, most history writing is still very centered on what the British did for Singapore. You know, and then um, the experiences of the local communities tend to come after that. They are like an, after, I would say an afterthought, but they are not really made central. Um, of course, I guess because it's, I guess both in terms of sources and in terms of um, interest, there are far more, I would say, in terms of community histories, um, those that are centered on the Chinese community as compared to the Indian and Malay ones. So honestly speaking, you can count on two hands, like how many books have been specifically written on um, either the Malay or the Indian communities in Singapore that are considered as um, standard history books. Yeah, how, how's the situation like for the Indian POWs, at least in Hong Kong? So Shafika said she can count less than, less than 10 books. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I can count less <laughs> than five for, for the Indian community in Hong Kong. Uh, I think the, the main problem for, for talking about Indian history in Hong Kong is the fact that we have Chinese history and then we have British imperial history. And so there is almost no space within historiography for anything else to exist. So there's such a strong focus on the conflict between East and West in Hong Kong. And there is so little written about ethnic minorities just existing between the Chinese majority and the British minority, but of course the, the overlords of, of the colony. And so in this case, for Indian POWs, there really hasn't been anything written about them, uh, except from that article by Vijendra Singh, 
Uh, and even that is only focused uh, purely on Indian POWs within the camp. So outside of the camps, uh, there were also free Indians who operated within the colony because, uh, because Japan was eager to show the world that they were supportive of the Indian in independence movement. And then their histories are gone because both the British and the Japanese just weren't interested in these Indians at all. So there really is a, a big gap regarding the history of ethnic minorities and especially Indians within Hong Kong history. Now that you mentioned it, something just came to my mind. I also find that um, the downplaying of Malay-centered histories in Singapore also has to do with, um, I guess, Singapore's broader history and its connection to the Malay world. Because Singapore was part of Malaysia before 1965 for a very brief period. And I always say that um, Singapore as an independent country in terms of writing its history, she always has to um, make herself an other to the entity that she broke away from. And yeah, because how do you put it? It's only recently, I guess, with the Bicentennial that there has been greater efforts to acknowledge that Singapore has always had like a long-standing historical relationship with the broader Malay archipelago. But all this while, Singapore has always presented herself as um, special or an outlier or something that's unique in the region, um, while also forgetting that, um, historically speaking, for centuries, she always has had um, long-standing relationships with the Malay Peninsula and the what is now called the Indonesian archipelago. So I guess there's a mix of both national interests in terms of um, what you call it, nation building histories, as well as interest on the part of historians themselves. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a pretty interesting line of discussion. And, and obviously your, your papers have already gone into that in, in quite a bit of detail. So I suppose uh, we can lead into a slightly different topic off, off the side of it a bit, which is that of course, Japan is, is an interesting country in this broad period that we're discussing, which is mostly 19th, early 20th centuries, because although, as, as Jun, you've noted, I mean, Japan was kind of challenging some of these European hierarchies it was it was encountering, it was also participating them into a considerable extent. And, and obviously, Simon, you must have seen some of this in Hong Kong as well. I think the question I want to ask is, I mean, to what extent was Japan actively challenging the sorts of hierarchies and the underpinning frameworks of those hierarchies that were being introduced by European imperialism, as opposed to taking a slightly nuanced view, but still participating in that system and accepting its conceits? Um, yes, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I think based on the way you framed the question, I would say Japan did a little bit of both. Um, so Japan really drew on the potential of its art to assert itself on the international stage. But by doing so, the government confronted a very contradictory situation in that in order to be deemed a modern society, uh, it demanded that Japan really abandoned what the West seemed as their or what the West portrayed as the very like primitive past um, and tradition in favor of you know, foreign and modern institutions. But at the same time, that past had to be like reorganized and then idealized into a narrative that reflected something that everyone recognized as progress. And I think I mentioned this in my presentation, but when the Japanese government constructed the Phoenix Hall, the eras that they chose to identify or to represent directly corresponded with the pre- Columbus, then Columbus era and industrialization era. So even the people who were involved in making the hall really deliberately employed this like very Western centric historical narrative in order to specifically reach out to and impress a Western audience. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you spoke to a member of the Meiji government, I feel like they would insist that art, the art of Japan had like transcended any kind of pre-existing Western paradigm of beauty, but the, in reality, in order to be taken seriously in this world, uh, Japan had to function strategically and not idealistically to a certain extent. And that meant that they had to conform to standards that existed at the time. 
I think for for Japan and Hong Kong, it's very much the same story as as what Shirin just said. There's a there's a veneer of rhetoric uh, above the practical realities of imperial rule. So in the case of Hong Kong, of course, there's the famous Asian co prosperity sphere of uh, of Japan during uh, World War II, and so there's always this idea of Asian for the Asians. There's always this rhetoric of uh, equality among all different Asian peoples. But of course, uh, there's always someone more equal than others. And in that case, it's Japan. And so in, in actual pr practicalities, they're using the Indians almost the same way as the British by using them as policemen, actually. So policemen, uh, Indian policemen is a very interesting case in that uh, the British used them as uh, guards, as policemen in their uh, settlements all across uh, China. So in, in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, uh, Indian policemen were a very prominent role in British rule. And so uh, it's almost, there's a very strong hatred of Indian policemen uh, by the Chinese populations of these different settlements. Uh, and even going into the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, it's almost like the same case. These Indian policemen are, are continue to be the buffer between the uh, the colonizers and the colonized. So, in in the practical sense, there really is no Asian for Asia for the Asians. It's just the same old imperialistic structures that still exist uh, within Asia. Yeah, I was wondering actually. Um... When you were doing research, this applies to Safika also, when you were doing the research on the ethnic minorities within the countries you're studying, I was wondering if there was, if you determined or identified any differences between how they wrote about the Western colonizing powers and the way they portrayed Japanese colonizing powers, because both experienced both. So I'm wondering if there was a difference in like rhetoric or the way they're being portrayed, depending on who is colonizing them. Well, how do I put it? Um, at least in, in Singapore for the Malay community, I, I, mean, I can't speak for the Indian community because I haven't seen the sources. But for the Malay community, I will say it's, it's a bit of a mixture. Because to be fair, most Malay, most Malays who could write back in the 19th century, they had like very glowing praises for the British. They adored the British or whatever it was worth. <laughs> and then, um, but of course, like things change along the way. So like by 1930s, when ideas of, you know, self-determination started uh, proliferating in the region. So um, some of it uh, came about um, due to inspiration by what was happening in the Dutch East Indies. And then of course it uh, filtered over onto the Malay Peninsula in Singapore, which was an intellectual hub. So everybody just get it there and like, exchange radical ideas and whatnot. Um, so yeah, so there was some that would have, you know, view the Japanese as um, bringing about a different era, but I guess like what Simon pointed out, it was all very short-lived, you know, like the, they had all these like fancy dreams and then when the realities of the occupation hit, it was like, uh, it's just the same thing, just a different face. Yeah, I definitely agree with Shapika. It's it's the same case in, in Hong Kong. There's a, there's a initial euphoric uh, euphoric, um, what's the right word? Response to to Japanese rule because oh, we have a uh, we have Asia for the Asians. We have a new new freedom to move around in this colony. But in reality, it's almost the same thing as uh, the British imperialist of before. So there really is no difference uh, after say a year or so of uh, negotiations between Indians and the Japanese. So there really is no difference uh, in essence to, yeah. towards <laughs> British and Japanese rule. So, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say too, of like all the countries in terms of their relationship to Western powers, Japan really adopted the, if you can't beat them, join them kind of attitude. <laughs> yeah. um, so I would say that definitely affected the way they dealt with the way they dealt with their Asian neighbors instead of being like, oh, let's work together. They you know, claim this greater East, was it Asia co-prosperity sphere, but we're still in charge kind of attitude. Yeah. 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 Less, less Asia for the Asians, more Asia for Japan, but we'll pretend it's for the Asians. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or rather, or it's more like um, we'll support the Asians in so far as they don't go against us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 before I move on to, to a, a broader discussion question, I did have a very specific question that emerged um, out of the question we just had, um, which is very specifically for Shirin, which is that, as you noted, the third of the halls chronologically that, that was included was um, for the Tokugawa, which is quite interesting because, of course, the Meiji state had sort of forged itself in the fires of a civil war to overthrow the Tokugawa. And I just wanted to ask, uh, as, as briefly as desired, um, kind of how they reconciled choosing the Tokugawa as this presentation of Japanese modernity when they had overthrown them barely 30 years before? Yeah, that is an excellent question. I wondered that myself. Uh, a part of me feels like they wanted to portray the Tokugawa era to show, look at this giant step we've taken from, you know, the ruins of a civil war to this like modern Meiji state. But at the same time, everything Japan, the Imperial Commission did in constructing the Phoenix Hall didn't really reconcile any of the disparities in the history or what they were doing. It was more like if we just don't address it, no one will ask maybe. It seemed like that was the case. And even though, again, there were so many inconsistencies in this history they were portraying, they just kind of glazed glazed past it by saying, oh, there, there are no gaps. I don't know what you're talking about. There were no gaps because the official report stated that there were no gaps. And therefore, once it was propagated enough, everyone agreed that there were no gaps. <laughs> And I think this is, this is something that came into my mind because like, I would think that across all our papers, um, there's this whole idea about national constructions of history and how they like to, it's, it's a mixture of mismaking and making sure everything is so clean and there are like no gaps and everything is, you know, your biggish idea of history that we are just like progressing forward towards this fantastic future. And here we are <laughs> all of a sudden. But yeah, like what Sharon said, you know, like in cleaning up all of these gaps, it just means that there are there are glaring um, things that are technically missing, but they just don't address it, or um, they are downplaying certain, I would say, contradictions and inconsistencies. Yeah. I was going to say, too, just a quick question to both of you, Simon and Sapika. Uh, when you were doing your research, personally, I noticed that there were a lot of documents I found that, like, very deliberately and specifically titled the document with official blah, 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 whatever the document was. Did you come across that, that they would use the term official? Because I'm assuming in Chinese, it would be very similar to Japanese, but assuming that if the document was official, it was probably the most accurate variation of whatever history that happened. Because I found that it was the opposite. Like whenever I found a document that stated it was official, I was much more doubtful of the factuality of it all. <laughs> Simon, you want to go first? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a case where it actually mentions official in the title. Um, yeah, because Japan yeah. really overdid it with the official. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they they have, have to make sure that you know it's official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't say that I have come across any in my research. Because I, I would think that the British kind of like took it for granted that if it's produced by the, you know, the colonial office, it is as official as it can get. You don't have to put in official there it's already official i think i think for for indian pow's in hong kong uh there is a differentiation a sort of a differentiation between uh civilian sources and military sources so when because i mostly look at uh british uh files in the national archives and so uh, a lot of it is written by uh, military personnel and so they treat civilian perspectives as somewhat suspect, uh, suspect, while military perspectives are definitely like, oh, it's all accurate. Like only military officers know what's going on. And so there really is, there isn't an explicit case of saying, oh, this source is official, this source isn't, but there's sort of like an implicit bias towards uh, military, military identification and uh, a military perspective of, what's going on in Hong Kong, basically. Which is actually quite a nice segue into a, a question that I had uh, um, directed very specifically at, at um, Shurin and Shafika. So thank you, Simon, <laughs> um, for, for accidentally stumbling on the same topic, um, which is to do with actually the, the sorts of sources you're looking at. Because 
Now, to what it, it does come across that these are quite elite sources, and I wanted to ask how far these sources might help to illuminate what um, non-elite perspectives on, in the Singapore case, British colonialism, in the Columbia Exposition case, um, Japan's place in the world, um, how these might have been, to what extent non-elite perspectives are illuminated through the sources you've looked at, and I guess to some extent, how much of an issue it is if they're not. Um, well, I was just going to say, for me at least, um, I think, again, I mentioned this before, but Japan occupies this very unusual position between being the victim and being a perpetrator in that the nation never actually directly experienced colonization in the same way that other Asian countries did. Uh, but there was still this external pressure and constant looming threat of Western imperialization as well. But at the same time, Japan was the colonizing power for places like you know, Hong Kong and Singapore. And so when I was looking at my sources, much of these official government reports and documents uh, had to be problematized a lot. Um, so much of what I was using to came directly from government figures and these early influential cultural leaders who, you know, to a certain extent endowed literally everything they wrote with some sort of underlying ideological motive or political intent. And I would definitely say that because of that, the sources I used did very little, I mean, if anything, to reveal the popular perspective, especially because the battleground for this kind of like aesthetic competition between Japan and the West happened within only the upper echelons of the government. Yeah, I, I guess in my case, um, the poems that I looked at, well, even though they were written by an elite, someone in the elite, in elite insofar as he was literate and working in the company, but the stories that he was telling, I would like to say he was gossiping through his poems, basically, uh, stories that he heard from people around him. So this will not just be uh, the merchants, but also the working class, basically like uh, Malay laborers who are working in the company. So there was this other poem um, written by the same guy, Tuan Simi, where he, uh, basically the whole poem was about how the company was not paying the Malay laborers properly. Like they were underpaid or they were not paid on time or they were just retrenched without warning. And then, of course, you know, his poems were all peppered with all of their um, struggles and all of their dissatisfaction. Yeah. So I will say that it sheds a bit of light on the non elite voices and experiences. But because of the nature of the sources, they are not, how do I put it? Like, you can't really, like, you know, put it in a piece of writing and say, like, oh, this happened because it. It's, it's, it's basically literature. You have to be able to contextualize it in a different, we, we have, if other things, you can't just take it at face value. Thank you. Uh, I think to kind of round this off and, and staying to some extent on, on, on the topic of, of sources, but with, with less of a, 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 an interrogati interrogatory um, approach, I, how effectively do you think you've been able to illuminate and foreground the perspectives you have been after? through the sources you've used, because as we've been talking about all night, there are obvious limitations, not just in the sources themselves, but also the way that they tend to be used historiographically. I would guess that for me, at least, it just means that I am letting the sources guide me to the stories that the author wants to tell, instead of, I mean, I tried my best to keep myself out of the picture, but also in it, how do I put it? Like at every point I am conscious that whatever I write can never be exactly what my sources intended to narrate. It was always filtered through me, but I try my best to empathize what the author and the narratives that have been presented in these sources. So it's not perfect, but I hope that at least it does shed certain light on certain stories that will otherwise have been ignored or downplayed. I struggled a lot during researching for my paper because there isn't, as, as I mentioned in my, in my talk, there isn't, there's no way for the Indian POWs to show any agency at all within their own writing because there isn't any existing writing uh, 
so there really isn't a perspective that I can take out. Uh, so I really struggled a lot with this question. Uh, but I think, I think Gajendra Singh said it really well uh, in, the, in his book. I think it was called The Testimonies of Indian Soldiers and the Two World Wars. He said he can't, even he as a much better historian than I am, he can't gain a very coherent picture of what actually happened through these sources because there's, it's always almost compromised in a way. So for, for, sen for uh, interrogation reports, there's always some element of censorship. Uh, in British reports, there's always like a pro-British bias. In Japanese reports, it's always, it's always very much Asia for Japan. So, so, but I think at the end, there's still uh, some sort of presence of the soldier within these sources. So just, just the, the, the very way of, of compiling report or just sitting down in a courtroom being interrogated, it's still significant, even if it's only like a single sentence in the report or a single sentence uh, in, in the newspaper. So I think even in the most biased and compromised sources, there's still an element of Indian agency and resistance. There's still something that can be discovered, even though we can't hear uh, their own voices. There's still always something that can be dredged up through uh, various historical sources. So I think uh, at the end of the day, I can show maybe not the perfect picture, but uh, in any case, a picture of how Indian POWs experienced uh, their lives between two empires. Thank you. And Shurin? Yeah, like I said, um... I really went into the research deciding that I was going to look at the sources with a grain of salt. Um, I did a lot of fact checking, uh, especially when any sort of government or bureaucratic report made some kind of extreme claim. Um, I think I mentioned this in the presentation, but when the official pamphlet for the Phoenix Hall uh, stated that the mythical Phoenix was born in Japan, I, my first thought was, is it, is it really? Because now I know for a fact, like based off of pop culture and any other research that's been done in the past hundred years, that it, it is from China. Um, and just going off of that, there were so many explicit and implicit erasures of any sort of Chinese influence and in the history and development of just Japanese art within these documents. So just knowing that so many of these government officials who were involved had very strong kind of nationalist leanings uh, and a very intense sense of, you know, Japan's cultural particularity uh, that really helped me navigate and kind of examine these sources in a more critical way. So, yeah. Um, I think with that, that covers most of the major questions we had for this panel. So. I think we can, I suppose, move to final statements. I guess one thing that we can all come to an agreement today, based on our discussion, is that no matter how little or non-existent traces of historical figures that we are trying to write about seems to be in our sources, my history is just like a ghost. It never really goes away. It just floats around. And then somehow we as historians, uh, like mediums, you know, when we go into our sources, sort of like play through and hope that we can commune with whatever voices and whatever ghosts that are still lingering around and hopefully be able to well, help tell their stories. Yeah, um, so that's that. And I guess the other main takeaway for me is that, well, it's really, I guess it's been quite an interesting discussion. And I would say that um, generally all of us looked at how communities try to transitional periods in history, like how they try to make sense of a world that is coming into being when at the same time the old world was still still there, still around. So try to make sense of how everything is and how they should be in this new world, you know, whether they should live behind what they knew about the old world or you know, roll over things into the future. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Ask the Students Conference Committee for doing all the hard work in the background as well as my fellow panelists and our moderator for a very stimulating discussion on Asian encounters with imperialism and modernity. So I think if, if I could choose one word which links today's papers together, it'll be anxiety. So more specifically, 
the anxiety of Singaporeans, Indians, and the Japanese over appropriate responses to drastic changes brought about by colon colonialism and modernity. So in the case of my paper, uh, Indian POWs captured in Hong Kong, these anxieties could lead to vastly different choices. So some collaborated with one empire to throw up another. Many adopted, uh, say, a wait and see attitude, while others resisted uh, in the name of an empire which suppressed their freedoms at home. So their varied experiences have been missing from local, national, and transnational histories. And I hope my paper today and our discussion today can help shine a light on the anxieties and choices and struggles made by those caught between empires and caught within the trap of colonialism. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. I just want to say thank you to Jeremy for being a great moderator. Uh, and I also wanted to thank, of course, the other panelists, Safika and Simon, uh, for introducing me to really interesting post-colonial perspectives across Asia that I otherwise never would have come across. I think they're very important now, especially more than ever. And I, if this panel has made anything clear, it's that so much history has been you know, erased or obscured and in some cases missing altogether. So it's very important for us to keep looking for and portraying these perspectives in order to reconcile a very, a largely Eurocentric uh, understanding of history. So thank you again to everybody. <laughs> thank you. I, I don't know how much more I can really add um, from what the panelists have said. I, I think we it has been a, a very stimulating discussion. And the, yeah, although we're looking at three distinct contexts over the course of over a hundred years, the same, very similar sorts of pressures applied to all of the people whom the, the panelists were discussing, be they Indian prisoners of war or Malay poets or Japanese art commentators, um, albeit from a very government curating perspective. Um, and so I, I would, so as not to try and restate any conclusions that have already been said, I would just like to thank again the organising committee of uh, the Digital Conference, and I would like to thank our, our speakers for coming on today and doing the conference with us, because you know, without you this would not be possible in the slightest. <laughs>